Hey guys, welcome to the Undynamic Duo. I'm Franz. I'm Kevin. Welcome back to Avengers Tower and the Batcave. Hey Kevin, I'm pretty excited today because we're joined by Gary Carlson. And Gary is the writer, editor, publisher. I mean, he pretty much does it all for Big Bang Comics. He's been around for quite some time since the 80s, right, Gary? That's and right. So, so Gary, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Let me start off by congratulating you because I love doers. I absolutely love doers. And you're doing it. I mean, you're, you're, you're doing it. You're publishing comics. You're essentially living the dream. Uh, True. So many of us think about doing that. We, we love the material. We love the genre. We have our own ideas. And it's one thing to have it. And it's another thing to actually go out and do that. And so congratulations on that. Thank you very now, much. Tell me about Big Bang Comics. Tell me about how that started, um, what you guys are about. T -t Tell me about Big Bang. Big Bang is retro comic. We started it um, in the 90s, basically, that to do the kind of comics we grew up loving, myself and Chris Ecker, my partner on the book. Gotcha. Um, what it really is, I mean, it, it started in Megaton back in 1981. Megaton was a... Uh, a book I did ran for eight issues and took a bunch of years <laughs> to get all of them out. But uh, it was pretty much a new generation of heroes. There were a couple of new ones in there and some of the old ones, Ultraman was one of the old heroes and he kind of died off in the first storyline. And there was another one that actually became the Night Watchman who is the other um, leader of the uh, Big Bang group. So. I mean, we did pretty much the newer stuff in the 80s. And then in the 90s, uh, Chris Ecker and I were talking about it. And he said he got tired of editors telling him he drew like an old guy and wanted to draw an old story. And but that said, he had a character called the Night Watchman. And I said, geez, if he had a K to that and make it the Night Watchman, it could be a Batman type. He had originally figured on a, a Daredevil type character, but... By doing that, we ended up heading toward a DC type universe with a Superman-ish type character, a Batman-ish type character. And the idea was to, to honor the, the writers and, and artists from the 40s and 50s and 60s and even the 70s. And so that was the plan. I mean, we had these archetype heroes um, and we were doing stuff in Siegel and Schuster style and Bob Kane style and, and, and all that. But the plan was we could have told the stories in any style. There's a Night Watchman story told in Will Eisner style. We had planned to do some in Simon and Kirby style, just, just having fun. I mean, all the characters, we gave them their own backgrounds and their own villains. I mean, they're sort that you know they definitely bear some resemblance to the uh the archetypes they're based on but uh it, we kept trying to do our own thing new stories that people hadn't read we i try not to do homages where someone come in and write a story that's based on another story or covers that are homage covers and pretty much ripped off from something else you know we try to do it new so Anyway, yeah, I mean, Megaton, Megaton was known for the people that got their start, the artists and writers that got their start there more than for the characters. I mean, Eric Larson, Rob Liefeld, Mike Gustavich, Butch Geis, um, Dan Reed and, and Angel Medina, those guys were all, uh, yes, Clark Hallbaker, they were all in the, the, the eight issues of Megaton. Oh, they, they were. They, they were. were. They, and that was, they, the, that was, I mean, Eric had been self publishing before that, but um, he did, he worked on the first four issues of Megaton and Savage Dragon showed up in, I think, the end of number two. Yeah, Rob. Oh, I you're think kidding. I published, nope, I think I published Rob's first piece that was an inside front cover for number five or six. That's um, awesome. That is he did awesome. A backup, he did a backup story in number eight. Uh, we, we solicited Big Bang special number one with Youngblood. I mean, because he had 
his young blood team and we were going to publish a special edition but by 1987 the uh black and white boom was going and our numbers were going down it was harder and harder to find an audience we had orders for like i don't know 200 copies or something of young blood i mean it had a cover by by rob and uh oh geez i forget uh but uh, it's neat i mean but, but this is clearly pre pre image comics yeah so yeah when they started in 92 rob somewhere called me the grandfather of image comics just cuz <laughs> young blood and dragon were it in got there, published you know? so, yeah so i was i was sort of famous for a short time and people were asking me do you wanna can we publish something do you have anything and the last the megaton holiday special which hadn't come out was just about finished and it came out then uh, through Don Chin's Z Entity comics. And then I heard from Caliber Press in Detroit and they wanted to do something and ended up doing a book called Berserker there, which was one of the characters from Megaton. And uh, and then the backups there, I mean, like I said, Chris Ucker and I, we wrote the, the Night Watch, the first Night Watchman story. It looked kind of like a 40s story. The second one was a backup of, of Ultraman and uh, it was funny because people at the time actually thought we had found this old, very obscure <laughs> golden age stuff. It, it was a lot of fun. We had approached Caliber and asked if they wanted to publish a Big Bang book because it was fun to do. And they were like, nah, no one's going to want this. And then shortly after that, 1963 debuted at Image and had, you know, everybody talking. And then Caliber's like, okay, we'll, we'll do the Big Bang book, you know. And so a couple issues later, then we started big bang and pretty much ended the berserker book so so you said so much and i've got so many questions and kevin oh, forgive me. <laughs> <laughs> me too but, but that's me and that's how and that's how big bang started so so that's how, so it's just guys hanging around deciding hey let's just do it the way that we would like to see it and then you go from there that's pretty much how it started. Like I said, we decided. And, to and how did you get to know the Eric Lawson's and Angel Medina's? How did you get to, well, to be? Well, that stuff orbit? wasn't, you know, that stuff wasn't retro. That was modern stuff sure. back then. And uh, I, I, I uh, the first guy that agreed to do something was Mike Gustavich. He agreed to do a story. Now tell me what that means. Forgive me, but tell me what that means. Did you call him and did you say, Mike, would you like to do a story or were you friends with him? Were you buddies nope. with him? You know, neither one. How I, did that come about? I would see him and other guys at, at comic Convention. conventions back yeah. then. Yeah. And yeah. then, you know, and I loved their work and they'd say, I can't get work out of Marvel and DC. They weren't hiring. And I thought somebody could hire these guys and have their own company. And that's kind of what happened. I asked Mike, Interesting. He, he said, sure, he'd draw a story, you know? And then I was like, okay, now I got to get other stuff. And what I decided to do was do a whole company company in the first book there's like eight stories eight fairly short stories but it introduces the the different characters it introduces ultra girl who is uh, ultraman's daughter it introduced megaton it introduced berserker uh there was another story called wizards of war and yeah i just uh either met guys at comic shows or i looked uh in uh comics buyer's guide uh, at the ads that were running. I mean, people looking for work or, I mean, Butch Geist was doing um, some art for the, what, Heroes Aren't Hard to Find convention out, out east somewhere. And I wrote to the convention and asked if they could put me in touch with, with Butch and they did. And he was working on, on uh, some other, something else at the point, but said he'd like to do a story, you know, cause they were short stories. Ken Landgraf, I knew Ken's work from the books he had been publishing in Land Graphics. Um, Eric Larson, I bought his self-published stuff and I loved it. And I thought this guy is going to be gone tomorrow. So I, I didn't even bother him. And a story someone else was drawing didn't work. And they said, hey, I sent this off to a guy named Eric Larson. And I was like, oh, wow. I said, that's cool because I loved his stuff. But I said, this character's not good enough for him. So when Eric got in touch with me and said he'd be interested, I came up with another character and said, I think this is, you know, more action packed and more your kind of thing. And that was Vanguard. And so mm. we did that. And uh, that, that's pretty much it. I mean, I either met guys at conventions and after the first issue or two, 
people started sending me samples in. And I mean, that's where I met Rob. Actually, Rob, I think, had applied, had sent some stuff to Now Comics in Chicago. And Chris Ecker was working there at that point. Chris was in on the first issue of Megaton. And he told Rob to send the stuff to me, which he did. And geez, I bet you I talked to Rob twice a week. I mean, he was so enthusiastic. He'd call up and we just talked for a long time and uh, he'd send stuff and he had some of the young blood stuff started, you know, and I said, well, let, let's start, you know, with a megaton story first and then we'll do the one. So um, that's pretty much how it happened. I, I'm going to go ahead and credit you for discovering Eric Lawson and Rob Liefeld. And <laughs> well, that's... <laughs> yeah, I don't know if you can call it actually discovering them, but I, you know, I helped them out and gave them. Hey, listen, that's the credit. That's take, 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 <laughs> which is no small feat, which is no, it's a huge yeah. contribution, obviously, to the industry. Um, that's fascinating. You brought up, for example, the homage, uh, not wanting to be homage, but yet wanting to capture um, um, a time period, which Kevin and I have discussed. And the samples that you sent to me, that's exactly what we see. We see that you were literally working to capture particular eras, the, the golden ages and the yep. silver age and so on and so forth of comics. Tell me what that's about and who therefore, so what are you trying to do? Who's your tar target audience? What is the appeal that you're trying to get to? What, what, t tell me the marrow, because I don't know if you know about this show, but one of the things that we are is, is we're purists and we do this show from the point of view of respecting the material, respecting the original material. And we feel that there's too many changes that have taken place in comics where you almost don't recognize the industry and the genre anymore. Right. So we are purists. Uh, I am more of a 60s, 70s purist. Kevin goes back a little bit further than I am. But when you introduce the 1940s style comic, what are you trying to do? Pretty much just having fun. I mean, you know, we that again, that I mean, the, the 40s stuff, we set it up like DC's Earth One and Earth Two. We we came up with some of the characters in the 40s, but with the time frame from 40s even to the 80s, all the characters would yeah. be 60 years old. So we kind of use the one characters and do what we want and say, oh, that's a different world, a different dimension. And then we started it over in say 1960 or something. And even now, I mean, that was 60 years ago and we fudged the time. It's only been 30 years. I mean, you know, I mean, DC never, they didn't use to advance time. I mean, the years didn't pass. Superman was 29 for, for right. so many years. And I don't know, I, <laughs> I enjoyed that more. I don't, yeah, I'm not a big fan of what's going on in comics these days. Don't read a whole lot. I mean, I, everything Eric Larson does, I, I follow. Um, and a couple other things. I mean, there's, you know, a couple of Legion of Superheroes, Teen Titans were my favorites and I'll pick those up once in a while and check them out and see if I should be reading them, you know? That's but, such a sad thing because there's so many of us in that category. People who love the, the genre, love the material, love the characters. And yet we don't, we don't read them anymore. We don't, we're not connected anymore because they've sort of moved past us. And it's an interesting thing because they are trying to appeal to a younger generation, but I don't think the material that they're producing actually appeals to the young generation. Uh, yeah. So. yeah, when I was growing up, I mean, stuff was kind of all ages, you know, I mean, aimed at kids, but adults could enjoy it because it that's was exactly that correct. The Marvel, exactly stuff was, Marvel stuff was a little bit evolved, you know, but, you know, by the 70s, they were saying, oh, comics aren't just for kids anymore. And they were, you know, getting more violent and more this and more that. And yeah, they, they, they got away from it. And when DC changed their continuity with Crisis, you know, we, uh, that was kind of where in the 90s, he said, we can tell stories from before that. I mean, the stuff that people are missing, you know, and that's kind of how we started doing it. We decided 40s, 50s, 60s, and 70s, you know, now it's, yeah. it, we started that in 92. So that's been 30 years. So interesting. I mean, there, you know, we, we kind of add in a little bit, you know, most of the guys that are the artists and stuff that they grew up on the later stuff, you know, I mean, it's, it's a lot tougher now than it was 30 years ago to find people willing to try to draw 
in a retro style, whether it's Jack Kirby or, yeah. or Bob Kane or whatever. Now they all come in with a pretty modern style. It's pretty, I'm always real happy when I can find someone that'll take a shot and do a, a Bill Fuga or um, C.C. Beck style. Thing. Yeah, yeah. By the way, I noticed that again, you know, you're harking back to like the 1010s and the, you know, the, 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 you know, that style of comic and, and, um, and some of your, you know, Mighty Man, for example, I, I pick up a little bit of, of, of Will Eisner and, and, and so on and so forth. Um, question that I have, and, and Kevin, forgive me for dominating this, uh, this interview. I'm learning a lot. It's fine. <laughs> and, 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 you know, I'll ask this question and you could go. But so therefore, um, Gary, who is your target market? Who's your target audience? Are you looking for people that used to read comics in those 40s and or want to have that nostalgia and enjoy that material? Or are you trying to appeal to the new kids? There's a sort of a dilemma that's been created that I wanted to get your take on. I think that comics and the industry has changed to become, it's become darker, more, more, uh, more uh, serious tone, uh, more complex and more complicated in an effort to appeal to kids. Having said that, I don't think kids actually respond to that sort of complex, dark, murderous type of characterization. But at the same time, because that's the material that they're being offered, I don't know that they'll respond to a Will Eisner type of style of approach. What do you think about what I just said and who is your target audience? Yeah, I agree. And a target audience, I don't know. I'm kind of <laughs> hoping, hoping to appeal to people that have been reading the book from the 90s. And we're doing some more modern-y looking stuff uh, with, with artist Ron Williams and a lot of the stuff coming out of uh, Spain by way of Pedro Augusto. Um, it, it's not really modern, but it's more of a 80s, 90s type stuff, which a sort of a generic modern feel to it, you know, or sure, sure. to modern comics. But I mean, there are guys drawing in a modern style. So I, I don't know, you know, I just kind of just kind of doing it. I mean, <laughs> wow. doing it for myself and wow. the guys do it, do it because they love the kind of stuff we're doing, you know. I mean, that's one reason. I mean, we were at Cal, uh, Caliber Press initially with Big Bang, and they were pretty much trying to sell through Walmart, and they wanted to own, own the copyrights, and I said no, and then we, we stopped there and ended up going to Image, because Eric was a fan, Eric Larson was a fan of Big Bang, and he gave us the chance to move it over there. I was already doing the Vanguard book for him there, and eventually uh, run on Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, so we went to to image, but even there when stuff was still selling pretty well, I mean, not, yeah, I mean, being a retro book like that, our orders, I think, started at like 12,000 or 15,000 and went down, you know? Interesting. By the end of six issues, the first six issues were in color. And by the end of that, I think I owed image $15,000. Wow. wow. So wow. we did the next batch in black and white to pay back the bill there. And then we were breaking even for a long time and finally finally gave up i mean it was just i didn't want to end up owing them money again so so it's not it's no longer big bang is no longer being published by uh, image not by image no i self-publish it now through indieplanet.com is is pretty much the only place you can get you can order back issues through the big bang comics website yeah, sure. but uh the new books are they're they're just print on demand um digital or you know printed copies from uh, indieplanet.com. Are you in our comicsology at all or no? Uh, digital digital uh, comic um, publication through. Uh, oh, no, 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 through yeah, Amazon. Not, not yet. yet. It's something I probably look into. I wanted to get kind of a, a background or a, a, a backlog of books, makes you know, sense. in order to make do that. So, it may just check. It depends on how long I stay with it. You know, like I said, they were in the old days, megaton days. The printers would have a minimum of two or two thousand or twenty five hundred copies. So you you had to buy that many, regardless of how many orders you got in. And and in the eighties with megaton, that kind of worked. You know, 
after we left Image and uh, did self-publishing for about six issues, the orders weren't, you didn't have to order quite that many, but there were still minimum orders of a thousand or whatever. And and uh, the sales just weren't there. I mean, through Diamond and then Diamond wanted each book to make X amount of money and, you know, as, or sell this many copies. And we just didn't have the, didn't have that big of an audience, you know? Understood. Understood. Yeah, we did a couple issues at AC Comics, AmeriComics, 80 pagers, because that way it was a $10 book and they could make the money back that that image required, or not image, uh, pre previews. If I said image before, I'm sorry. That's fine. Diamond, diamond previews, you know, they, like I they they're the ones that wanted X amount of profits and, and with a, Ten dollar book, they could do it at at AC Comics, but I uh, did a couple issues of that. But eighty pages, that's tough to fill. So I decided just to go into self publishing and do more twenty four or thirty two page books. And printing today allows you to print per order essentially, so you yeah, don't have to. Buy. Yeah, Kablam! I mean, Indie Planet is part of Kablam the press, and I love love the work they do printing. Uh, the books all look good. Yeah, I, I can order individual copies there and then I can put them up for sale on the internet at any planet so before before I pass this on to Kevin <laughs> let me applaud you seriously let, let me applaud you uh, and I'm, I'm going to applaud you because I love that I love people the, the true artists and the true creators who are doing it for the love of the work rather than anything else not doing it for profits not doing it for fame or anything like that Clearly, what I'm picking up from you is that you love this material. You're a genuine artist at heart. You, you feel the need to produce and you put your money where your mouth is and you are doing it. And I applaud you for that. I find that to be Very heroic. Much. And, and the, the, you know, I, Kevin and I have talked about this in the past. So I'm not saying something <laughs> just, just to, to, to gas you up. But I have as much respect for the doers who don't succeed as the doers who succeed. Because the difference between the doers just don't succeed and those who succeed is a lot of it is right place, right time, luck, you know, luck of the draw, you know, that kind of stuff. And so I applaud you, my friend. Great. Thank you very much. That's fantastic. Uh, you, you have my admiration. Kevin, I don't know if you have any questions. Though. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Uh, Gary, may I ask, um, because uh, what you dealt with on, on a primary level when you first started and even now, uh is the retro style was there ever a point where dc and or marvel kind of stepped in and tried to stop you or your team from doing what you were doing because it was too close to something else nope never they they've never no one's ever bothered me i every once in a while would send a note in probably more to marvel saying i'm already doing it character called that you know and they'd say okay it didn't necessarily stop them from doing it because i didn't have a book and trademark and whatever but i just didn't want them coming back to me it still happens now we've been doing a character called shutterbug for a couple of years and just in the last year they've done a, a spider-man thing called shutterbug you know so uh, we so the night watchman's main villain the whole time has been a guy called the pink flamingo and a couple of years ago dc came up with a pink flamingo and somebody else you know so that's how let me works. ask you let me ask you this gary um obviously um there are similarities between for example the night watchman and batman oh yeah um, um you know from the robin the batmobile and so on and so forth what's the thought there why such a close resemblance and and do you you know, did you fear that DC might say something? We wondered if they might come after us, you know, but like I said, we tried to uh, give the characters their own, their own backgrounds, you know, and make them different. We always called it the left-hand turn. I mean, we started with the idea, I mean, an archetype, and then we would do other stuff with it. I mean, we tried to make the villains different i mean it's tough because the artists they come along and say well i'm going to draw this guy looking kind of jokery or whatever you know but yeah i mean we set it out we wanted them to be like stories that that a fan had never read it a superman story or a batman story 
from the 40s or the 60s that they had not read. So we tried, like I said, it was as much an homage to the creators that had been writing and drawing them then as as Batman, you know, so or Superman or or anybody. Interesting. But you don't seem old enough, obviously, to be have to have read comics in the 40s. No. Where did that connection come well, from? And I started how... reading comics in about 1961, 62. I mean, I was okay. born in 57. So at that point, DC was releasing the 100 page um, annuals, reprinting stuff from probably from maybe the the 50s day. and some of the some of the 40s, you know, but growing up, the first couple of books I bought were Jules Pfeiffer's um, Geez, I don't even remember what it's called, the great comic book heroes. And then uh, Steranko's History of the Comics, Volume 1 and 2. And they introduced me to um, Will Eisner and a lot of the, the stuff from the 40s. I fell in love, you know? Interesting. I mean, I've always That's... wanted to be a cartoonist. I mean, since 61, I wanted to be a cartoonist. I wanted to be a syndicated cartoonist uh, you know, comic strips. And Did that, you ever try? No. Well, <clears throat> when I first met Chris Ecker, I was going to college. I, I was going to college uh, and I was majoring in animation and illustration. And I was working 30 or so hours a week. <clears throat> and so I didn't have really have time to draw. So we were working together. He was drawing and, and helping write. And we did a couple of comic strips and then uh, the Los Angeles Times was interested in one we had called Scrimshaw that was about pirates. And they wrote back and said, geez, we'd like uh, to see some more of this because we're thinking about syndicating it. So we did up another six weeks. And at that point I was, I had wanted, uh, uh, I'd won a, a prize uh, at the college. And just when I thought I was gonna graduate I, with my bachelor's, I won a scholarship for a master's program in political cartooning. Wow. Name, you know, it was after the a Chicago. So I, I couldn't turn it down. So I was stuck in school for another two years. And this was just at the tail end of that. And if, if we sold the comic strip, I knew that's what I was going to be working on. So I took six months off of that. We sent the more stuff in and waited, you know, and held our breath and they decided against it. They hmm. And thinking about three of them, I think they went with a Lone Ranger comic strip, but I mean, they passed on us and they passed on something else. And I don't remember what it was, but it, it's one that got syndicated somewhere else. So, I mean, it was <laughs> at that point that it kind of bummed me out. And then I, I turned my attention to Megaton and doing comics. That was about the same time that Mike Gustavich said he'd do something. So I started looking around there and I just I had realized there were so many better artists out there than me. I just started writing my first stuff. I would draw them out. Big fan of um, Jim Shooter's work on Legion of Superheroes when he actually drew them out, you know, and that's how I started and did that for the first issue or so till I found out people thought this guy doesn't know what he's doing. Then I started typing them up so they didn't look so fanish, you know, but, uh, <laughs> but that's how that came about. Kevin, yeah. did you have, I have so many questions, but uh, Kevin, did you have a question? Do you have anybody from today's audience, or, or not audience, but that is tied to today's comics that you'd like to have the opportunity to work with? Is there anybody, even with the style that you're talking about, that you feel could nail that style and would would kind of open your personal floodgates and say, okay, I'm here working with somebody that I really wanted to. Yeah, you know, there's not a whole lot of modern guys left. I mean, I love Eric Larson's work. Um, I approached Jerry Ordway at one point about doing something, but like I said, there's not a lot of money in this and I couldn't afford what, what some of the guys are asking. So I just know I'm working with the guys that are on. I mean, back when we started, we'd get covers and pinups and even stories from classic artists. Shelly Moldoff did some stuff and uh, we had a cover by Kurt Swan and Murphy Anderson. Actually, 
the first bunch of issues we did, Murphy Anderson's studio was doing the color separations for us. Um, later on, we had, uh, and my brain just doesn't work. So, but I, I worked with, with a lot of the guys that were my favorites growing up, you know, as far as guys that are working right now, I don't know that there's anyone I'd chase after. I mean, like I said, Eric Larson is a friend and, but I don't, he's busy. I'm not going to bother him. And, um, you know, Rob Liefeld's a nice guy and something like that probably would help sell a book. But as far as anyone else that's, you know, got a name or would help us get going, I, there's nobody offhand that I can think of that I would go to, you know? Right. And I, 